Uh, my name is Roy Keyes. I am a lead data scientist at Arundo Analytics. We are a software company based in Houston and Oslo, Norway. Uh, we <coughs> build software mostly for industrial companies like oil and gas, manufacturing, renewables, and uh, that software is intended to help those companies uh, build solutions using data science and machine learning and related technologies for their business problems. Uh, today I'm going to talk about automated machine learning. Um, really, there are other people who did all the work. Uh, these people right here, push cars here in the back. Uh, Henry is unfortunately sick today. Uh, Gunny is a Rice undergraduate who was an intern of ours this summer. He actually did all the initial work, but he is out of town having a good time, I hope. Today I'm going to talk about automated machine learning. I'm going to, since this is a, a plenary talk, um, I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a broad background on this before I get to our project in particular. So I'll talk a little bit about what automated machine learning is and how it fits into the world of data science and machine learning. And then talk about the research we did. Uh, this is a, a, a diagram showing a very simplified view of how supervised machine learning works. Um, you'll, any of you who've actually implemented supervised machine learning will know that, that this is clearly not what you really do. What you really do is something that's a little bit, it's, it turned into a mess. Uh, you know, in this one, we start off with some data collection, however you're gathering your data. Data exploration, ultimately cleaning and munching that data, and then, and then you get to feature, some sort of feature engineering, feature selection, and then model training and testing, and eventually deployment if you're building a data product. Now, uh, each of those steps, we start to see a lot of where iteration comes in. So when we get to the exploration phase, oftentimes we need to go back and get more data because we're missing data or whatnot. When we get to cleaning, that, op that often then leads back to more exploration, sometimes more data collection there. When we get to training, there, this is a very iterative step where we go and we need to work on feature engineering and other, other types of uh, data preparation to try to get the most information out of your data before you put it into your training model. Uh, and this often leads us to coming all the way back to the beginning because we just simply need to get more data or we realize that we need to get other data that was not available in the beginning. And then of course you finally deploy it and no machine learning model is going to be, as we'd say, fresh forever. It will become stale quickly because you may have found very nice correlations in some data to give you very good predictions, but the real world evolves. And so typically that's an iterative cycle too. You should probably never stick with your V0 model uh, forever. So what you, what you can see here is um, that this becomes very messy after a while, very iterative process, and, and a lot of things are happening. Um, I forgot one of my jokes, so I'll tell it anyway. Uh, the standard joke that, that is, the data scientists spend about 10% of their time actually training models. And the other 90% of the time is, is cleaning and munging data. And then the other 50% of the time is spent complaining about cleaning and munging data. <laughs> uh, now what you see here, like I said, this is very messy, and th but this is, this is what the reality is typically. And this also comes to the other joke that I didn't make up, which is that uh, you know, this is a very manual process, and, and a lot of people say, if you're doing research or something, the optimization tends to be the uh, graduate student descent, because you're, you're just having to, people manually go in and do all of this for you at some point. Uh, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about automated machine learning. So in this process, automated machine learning typically is focusing on these two areas, which are feature creation, selection, engineering, and training of models. Uh, sometimes uh, some automated machine learning will go more. We just heard about some, you might say, cleaning data, dealing with uh, problematic data points. Um, but this is the, the main focus is on these areas right here. Uh, when I'm describing automated machine learning, I typically will start off, start off by coming to hyperparameter tuning because a lot of machine learning practitioners are, they spend a lot of time in hyperparameter tuning, so they're very familiar with that. Uh, of course, hyperparameter tuning 
is all about hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are the parameters in your model that are set by the user. So you can think of if you were building trees, it's, it's how deep your branches are. If you had forests, that's how many trees are in your forest. Or uh, if other kind of models, you're choosing regularization parameters and your neural networks, how many layers. There are many, many choices you could make, but uh, usually you have to make those choices and then you start actually training the model. This in contrast to parameters, which are those internal parameters which are set during the training process based on, on your training data. Hyperparameters need to be tuned uh, for most kinds of models that are, that are very strong. There are a few, a few kinds of models like random forest which are, have very few hyperparameters and can do pretty well off the shelf, but a, a lot of the, the strong models need lots of hyperparameter tuning. And you can do that by hand. That comes back to uh, sort of the grad student descent I just mentioned. Uh, or you can do some sort of hyperparameter search. So it could be grid search, random search, Bayesian uh, methods. There, there are many different approaches to doing that. Auto, automated machine learning is basically a generalization of this problem. Uh, what you want to do is, in this approach is you treat not just hyperparameter tuning as, this, as a problem, but also model selection and feature engineering and selection. You treat it as one very large optimization search problem. Here's an equation. This equation is uh, something that, uh, there's a paper from Thornton and, uh, and the authors that were, that were created a system called Auto Weka. If you're, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but you've probably heard of Weka before, which is a, a machine learning system. And they described this problem. They came up with a fancy name, Cache, which is Combined Algorithm Selection and Hyperparameter Optimization. And essentially, what this equation says is we want to find the best algorithm and set up hyperparameters such that we're minimizing this loss function. So taking that all together in a very large optimization problem. Uh, you can you can imagine that you know suddenly your your search space for trying to find the parameters you want has exploded, and that is the case. Uh, I'm now going to talk a little bit about what's going on today in sort of the world, both kind of systems that are available in the commercial world uh, related to automated machine learning. Maybe I'll stop and I'll take a quick poll. How many of you, before walking in today or reading about that this talk was going to be about automated machine learning, had heard of automated machine learning? Okay. And how many of you had actually used an automated machine learning system before? Okay, good. So if I'm lying, very few people will know. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you look at Google Trends, I didn't put this in there, but there, there. Uh, if, you, if you look up automated machine learning or auto ML, you'll see this trend that's kind of going up and then there was a spike uh, probably about nine months ago or something. And that had to do with Google making some announcements. Um, and so th they released a system that they call auto ML, much to the chagrin of other people who are in this field who, who research auto ML because you know, they, they, uh, this is you know, Google auto ML TM. So there's a lot of uh, people worried about a lot of confusion there. Um, but as you can see, there, there's some very uh, uh, excited headlines, uh, things like Google self-training AI turns coders into machine learning masters. Uh, you, you can imagine that that, uh, that would be great, right? Um, they, they have a little bit of a different paradigm than what I've just described, and they, they talk about what, what they talk about is they call learning to learn. Uh, but in general, it's basically the same. This, this is from a, a slide from a, a talk from Jeff Dean, who I think came last year to Rice to talk, and, and maybe this slide was even in that talk. You can find it in several talks about what they're doing right now, uh, mostly at Google Brain. And the basic idea is that what, what we basically currently do is we have data in computation, but we also apply a lot of machine learning expertise to get to where we want to be. Uh, they have the hypothesis that instead of this, we can basically take data and lots and lots of computing resources and get to the same or a better place. That's basically the, the idea behind automated machine learning. Yes, in the simplest sense, uh, as I was just talking to one of my uh, friends here who's, who's skeptical of this approach, 
it is you're going to write a lot of for loops. <laughs> uh, but Google's approach mostly centers around what, what's called neural architecture search. So that's mostly looking, they're looking mostly at uh, neural networks, either how you, you could start from scratch, how you build up a network architecture. That's obviously a very difficult problem to start from scratch because it's a huge search space or doing some things around um, selecting pre-existing structures or other things. In fact, their first product that came out that's in part of this initiative was Google Vision. Uh, I can't remember the exact name. Google AutoML Vision or something. And from the people, sort of insider information I heard that mostly they were trying out like three or four transfer learning models and that was the extent of their search. But in the research side, they're doing a lot more interesting things. So here you can see they have a bunch of candidate neural network architectures, and then they're selecting the best one. And here they're saying, you know, a lot of iterations are going on to find that. So a lot of evaluation, a lot of computing power. If you're Google, that's not a problem. Uh, there are some other commercial people who, who are, uh, their, their vendors who are selling automated machine learning. One that you see often is Data Robot. Here they're saying, you know, this very simplified workflow, prepare your data, then you drag and drop it into their interface. It tries hundreds of models and then it deploys the best one and, and you know, you're, you're all happy. Um, H2O is also another company that has something, they have something called driverless AI, which I am very unfamiliar with this, but they obviously have good marketing because that's a lot of buzzwords altogether. Uh, there's also open source, which is, uh, this is where our interest is around open source systems. Uh, two of the ones that you'll run into a lot are Teapot, which I can't remember what that stands for. It's something like, I don't know, something pipeline optimization, something. And uh, this, is, this is a system that uses uh, uh, genetic algorithms uh, on top of scikit-learn and then auto sklearn. This is automated machine learning with auto, with uh, sklearn, scikit-learn. And then there's a very recent one, Auto Keras, which came out of uh, Texas A&M. And I figured I'd throw that in there for some local stuff. But this brings us to an obvious question, uh, especially if you, I mean, we saw that one headline that everyone's gonna be a, a master machine learner. And the question is, you know, this, People try to sell something like this, and, and, and what, is that true? You know, are, are we going to be, as machine learning practitioners, replaced by uh, a fancy for loop? And generally, we think no. Um, we, we think that uh, I'm very excited about automated machine learning, but not because I think that it will replace machine learning practitioners. Uh, there, there's just too many things that you need uh, experience machine learning practitioners to do to get good answers. And, and you know, of course, the, the main one is asking the right question. It, it is incredibly, incredibly easy to optimize for the wrong thing. And that all comes down to, uh, you know, asking the right question and getting the right metric. Uh, we do, do think that this will really help uh, data scientists become more efficient. Uh, we, we use it a lot for sort of generating baseline models and also for evaluating whether you can build a model on the data as it exists. That's often the, the case. One of the hardest things is going into a uh, machine learning related project. Someone hands you this data set, and before you've really done anything, you, you cannot give them any good answers about will this work, period, unless you've seen something very similar before. Uh, this leads us to, to our question that, that we were trying to address, and that, and that is, uh, which default model development strategy will give us the best results or reasonably good results for supervised learning in some short amount of time? And this is a scenario that, that we're faced with reasonably often. Um, I'll give you a little bit of context about what my team does. Um, at Arundo, we work in, in these kind of industry industries here, oil and gas, maritime renewables, manufacturing, um, transportation, and a few other ones. Our data science team, we work a lot with equipment that has lots of sensors. So it's typically streaming data with time series. And, and, and in those contexts, we're doing things like data-driven maintenance. And so we do a lot of things like anomaly detection and forecasting. And then we also do a, a, 
image and video applications and typically with convolutional neural networks, but then we also end up coming up across a lot of conventional, more quote, conventional machine learning problems, which, which I would say is you know, tabular data, uh, other things where, where um, you know, we're not gonna be using deep learning and we're not gonna be using something like time series methods. So we, we come up against this and, and what we've, internally since we mostly focus on these types of problems, we've been building lots of tooling around this to automate this as much as possible. So, but we still, we still come up against these and so that, that's where our question had arisen about what would be the best strategy to use by default. So for our study, basically what we decided to do was to look at some of these open source libraries, uh, specifically Teapot and, and AutoSkLearn, which I mentioned before. And then we also decided to use XGBoost as a benchmark because that's, that's an algorithm that we've used a lot. XGBoost, uh, if you're not familiar, is a fast implementation of gradient boosted trees designed to train very quickly. Um, and it has XGBoost and then other, other implementations of gradient boosted trees like LightGBM and uh, a couple other ones have done very well in a lot of machine learning competitions. That, uh, so it's, it's, we know that it is a very flexible and powerful uh, type of machine learning model. So we decided to use that as, as a benchmark. Uh, we also thought it would be interesting to use XGBoost with Teapot's feature selection. I'll talk about that in just a, mi a minute to sort of add as, as opposed to when we were looking at things using raw data with no kind of feature engineering or feature selection, we decided to add that as another interesting data point. And what we decided to do was try to look at, quote, a lot of data sets uh, with a mix of regression and classification uh, to understand this. But we're, and then we were looking on a fixed time scale, so something between zero and eight hours. Uh, part of our question was around, you know, where, where would we end up given more time and we want to see if there were trends that were obvious. A teapot is probably, in some ways, the, the most mature of these open source uh, libraries for doing automated <coughs> machine learning. Uh, it is a Python library. It sits on top of scikit-learn. So basically, all of the models that are available in scikit-learn are available to teapot. It uses a genetic algorithm to, to create what it calls pipelines. And those are sets of feature transforms and base models. And then it finally uses a type of stacked ensemble to combine those. And so this is an example of a pipeline where you're, you're taking, here they, they take both the copy of the data set, put it, use polynomial transforms to create features, use uh, PCA, and then do some combination. And then they do some feature selection here. And then they finally uh, put it into a random forest. Auto SK Learn is similar, except that it doesn't have a fancy logo. And uh, it, except it is also a Python library built on top of scikit-learn. And it is a descendant of AutoWeka, which I mentioned before. Uh, the big difference between Teapot and Auto SK Learn is that it, it is used a Bayesian optimization. And uh, it has some uh, interesting stuff that they've done to create some nice priors for that. Uh, but in the end, you, you, you get feature transformation based models and with a more simple weighted ensemble. Uh, I would say by anecdote, um, our impression in talking to other people is that probably these open source methods will get you 90% of the way to what the commercial solutions offer. Commercial solutions have a lot more tooling around them to do a number of other things. But for uh, people that are doing machine learning and, and, and are experienced and knowledgeable, probably the open source uh, libraries are the way to go. For selecting data sets, we, we looked at a number of data sets that are from the OpenML uh, data set repository. They have a very diverse set of data sets. And you can see here, here's a number of rows in a data set versus number of features. We, we tried to do, this is just a plot of where the data sets we chose fell. We tried to, to get a reasonably representative sampling uh, considering our, the resources that we had available to do this project. And uh, <coughs> uh, we tried. Uh, I'm going to just start talking about the results. Um, well, I'll tell the conclusion at the, in, in the end. But uh, here's, here's a page that has lots of plots that, that are showing uh, for a lot of regression tests we ran, 
Um, as you can see, some, you often end up in a situation where there's not really much difference between the different, different uh, strategies we use. Sometimes there's more separation, and we tried to get reasonable scales on these plots um, to, to show that versus you know, things that are squished together. Uh, in general, we, we seem to see that, that either one or both of the automated machine learning gave us lower error, a typical problem. Uh, this is split in half because we have a lot of data sets. This, this here is more regression. This is, these are binary classification tasks over here. Uh, you can see we, we did end up with some things where there was really no difference. Part of the reason for that is because the automated machine learning would, would find the same kind of solution with uh, it, XGBoost is one of, one of the models besides scikit-learn that was available to both Teapot and to uh, AutoSKLearn. So it would often end up using a XGBoost based solution. So often when we had similar performance, that, that was what was going on. Now we jump to the end. So I would say that the, we, we saw a couple different things. What, what, what's not clear from those plots is that we ran multiple trials on each of these. And uh, we, we didn't end up putting uncertainty or error bands around these because we didn't, didn't think that it was a very strong representation there. But we did see hints at some clear things on in regression. On the regression side, here we've got this sort of dark um, orange and blue, which are AutoSKLearn and Teapot, respectively, or the other way around. And we saw that for regression, we tended to get better results in a, in a clearer way. There was this divergence as, as you uh, let these, these algorithms run longer. In classification, it was much less clear. Um, and, and that brings us to sort of our conclusion, which was, we concluded that when we're doing regression on the typical types of tasks we run into, probably AutoML is going to be a good way to go. It's much less clear here. So our recommendations for our team going forward was that, well, this one doesn't really matter apply to the other team. So I guess I need to find out which one we're most experienced with uh, to choose that method. But basically, we, we recommended for our team to, to definitely try automated machine learning and we're also developing probably some better defaults for things like um, gradient boosted trees to have very nice parameter tuning and, and a few scripts that make it easier to run. But uh, it was unfortunately much less clear around classification what we would want to do. Uh, this, that said, even though we're planning to continue to use this and investigate it further, uh, there, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, both of these automated machine learning libraries that we use uh, can often end up in these very complicated solutions. Um, I, I've had some before where, you know, it said, we're going to use five different ex extra random trees models combined with K nearest neighbors and a bunch of different feature transforms. And it gets to the point where it's very hard to try to think about it in a way that makes sense. Uh, basically, you, you're in a position where you need to say, okay, there's a black box that came out of this, and for the most part, I'm not gonna look inside that black box. Um, although, oftentimes, you will end up seeing, oh, this is, this is using one kind of model, whether it's um, something like XGBoost, or maybe it's some sort of uh, other, other tree base or support vector machine or something, if it keeps landing on that same kind of model, then there's an indication that maybe you, you want to actually use that model itself and kind of run with that. Uh, another thing, uh, just this is that the automated machine learning, um, these libraries, they don't take runtime performance into consideration at all. One of the interesting things that Google is doing is they're using reinforcement learning to do this neural architecture search, and they're not only looking at the overall accuracy, but they also look at the resources involved to run it, and, and with, you can have multiple goals there that they, they use. Uh, but for example, if you, know, if, if you end up on like a K nearest neighbors where you're basically memorizing all of your data and, and it's gonna take a long time to run versus say some linear model, uh, this, this will not take that into account for you. So there are several trade-offs. And uh, with that, I think I will move to questions. Thank you. So we have
have time for some questions. Um, I'm going to start you off here. I'm just curious about, so you're developing a lot of different uh, machine learning algorithms. How does Arundo make that available to somebody that's interested? Is it software as a service? Is it consulting engagement? What's, what's the model of having done this, given that you're a company at some nevertheless? Uh, sure, sure. So probably about three quarters of what my team does is consulting. So that's part of the reason we developed some, we research this internally, is just to make ourselves much more efficient. Uh, what our company actually does is we, we have a platform that uh, teams our customers that have their own data scientists will use that platform directly to build solutions. Otherwise, we also have use case specific um, applications that we, that we also sell. And then, and then we also do a lot of custom work. So uh, we, we have a, this is, the, the kind of things we do are not as generally available, but uh, a lot of it's for internal. Hey, Roy. Very nice talk. This is Chen from Nadako. So just a quick question regarding your observation. So you talk, say about the regression task, auto ML is likely to uh, work and then less clear for the classification task. Do you, can you explain what's the reason behind that? Or is this limited to your own test? Or is in general, it's very difficult to do the auto ML for the classification? So, I, I mean, it, it works okay. We, we don't think that it doesn't work. But we, it's not clear to us which approach was going to be the best yet for, for uh, classification. I mean, uh, given the constraints of, of how we ran this, this project, if we, you know, we, we were looking at a relatively small number of data sets. We tried to be kind of representative, but it's still a low set. If we had run this on, say, hundreds of different data sets that were very diverse, then we would hopefully have a much more definitive answer. Maybe the answer is still in the end that, that there's not a big difference. Yeah, because classification to me seems very complicated when you decide how to measure the result, right? So whether you involve in balanced data set, that's a different story. So sure. that's why I think that's, in general, it's more complicated than just a regression you try to fit a line, yeah. It can, I mean, we limit it to, this is uh, just two class classification, and uh, we try to keep it as simple as possible while still being relatively realistic. Okay. have a question over here? Yes, I have some questions about optimization process here because I believe that you should have certain constraints, including when do you know that you're not running into overfitting, underfitting? What if you have uncertainty in the data, uncertainty in the model? How do you propagate that uncertainty from the training to the prediction part? So it seems to me that you have to take a, con, in, in, into consideration a lot of other factors. Right. And, and I would say that that comes back to uh, how much can you automate, right? I mean, uh, you know, even not, not looking at uh, uh, machine learning, but just trying to plot things when I don't know beforehand, but I need to make a lot of plots. You know, there's never a one size fits all. And uh, so that's where a lot of the human judgment is gonna come in. You may, you may be able to set some of the uh, constraints that make sense for the problem at hand, but coming in blind, uh, it, it is very difficult. Question back there. Very exciting talk, jo Roy. Thank you. This is Jacqueline from Bell College Mason. And two questions. First, do you think auto ML need more data than traditional ML? And second question, do you think it's easier to get overfitting if you use auto ML? Sounds like you end up might have very complicated model, and that's what we are afraid for. If it's very complicated, then it's easy to get overfitted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know that you need more data. You certainly need more computing resources. Um, but I think a lot of it is going to be the same scenario as doing manual machine learning. Uh, as far as overfitting, I mean, you, you want to do the evaluation the same way. Uh, you can create you know, learning curves. You can look at divergence between <coughs> training and test data and uh, make judgments the same way. Uh, I think because you end up in a lot of, with a lot of ensembles, that may help fight some of the overfitting. But uh, I don't know that it's, there's a definitive answer on that. But yes, you, you definitely need a lot of resources to do this uh, quickly. <coughs> Please join me in thanking our speaker again.